Hello everyone, welcome back to the Canadian Young Physicist Tournament's channel. It's been a while since I made my last video. I promise I'll make more videos during my Christmas break. Before we start, a couple of announcements. First, I am excited to introduce our brand new registration and tournament management system. Thanks to our information team members, we managed to build our own registration system to help us facilitate the complex task of registration, tournament planning, and automatic score calculation. If you're in Canada, you can learn how to navigate this system by clicking the How to Apply tab. You can begin the registration process by making your own account. Secondly, the registration information for COIPT 2020 are up on our website, go check it out. For today's video, we are looking at playing card. The problem statement says that a standard playing card can travel a very long distance provided that a spin is imparted as it is thrown. Investigate the parameters that affect the distance and the trajectory. I haven't been able to find a large enough space to throw my cards, so for this video, I'll focus on the initial state of the card and show you how you can obtain quite a lot of information about the motion by just analyzing a slow motion video of the card. First, let me show you how to throw the card so that you can get it to spin. After watching a few videos on this topic, it seems like there is a common technique. You pinch the card between your index finger and middle finger, then you swing your arm towards the direction that you want the card to go. Just before you release the card, you want to flick your wrist so that the card gains some additional angular momentum. By the end of the motion, your fingers should be pointing in the direction of the card's exit velocity, and if you did this right, your card should be able to fly at least 10 meters. From my experience, my card always hit a wall before it landed. If you're just throwing the card with your hand, there are some limitations. The parameters that you might want to vary are often coupled together. I am interested in understanding what sort of throws an average human can, well in this case it's me, produce. The standard playing card is roughly 63 by 88 millimeters. Every card also has a pattern that we can track. The auto tracker seems to be unreliable, so I had to track it manually. After hours of painstakingly clicking, I finally got some useful data. For every track, I can find the X, Y, and time data for each one of the two target points. Using this data, we can generate a variety of graphs. First up, I can plot the trajectory of the two target points. The orange dots represent the upper target point, and the blue dots represent the lower target point. As the card moves across the screen, we can see that the targets trace out a cycloid-like path. This indicates that the target points are both translating and orbiting the center of mass of the card at the same time. This is the key distinction between the physics of a point mass and a rigid body. When analyzing the motion of a rigid body, both translation and rotation has to be taken into account. The path that you see is a combination of translational motion and rotational motion. Since the two target points are the same distance from the center of mass of the card, we can take the average of their x and y position and obtain the x and y position of the center of mass, respectively. Plotting it, we can obtain the trajectory of the center of mass of the card as well. We can also plot the x, y position of the center of mass against time. The slope of these lines are the x and y velocities, respectively. Taking the square root of the sum of the squares, we can compute the speed of the card very easily. If we compute the y coordinate separation of the two target points, we can see that the characteristic sinusoidal curve. The period of this curve tells us about the angular velocity of the card. You might notice that the amplitude of the oscillation is decreasing over time. This is due to the card tilting away from the vertical during its flight. The marker separation we can measure is the target's projected image onto the camera sensor. So the separation that we see on video is actually the separation of the targets times the cosine of the tilt angle with respect to the vertical. So by analyzing the amplitude of oscillation, we could also get some information on the tilt angle of the card. 
With all of this information, I was able to quantify my throw. I threw 11 cards and computed the initial velocity and angular velocity of each throw. Here's a scatter plot of the velocity versus angular velocity of the card. We can see that the velocities range from about 7 meters per second to 16 meters per second, and the angular velocities range from about 95 radians per second to about 160 radians per second. This is quite a lot of scatter in the data, which indicates that my throws are far from repeatable. But the linear trend is quite clear, and here's a question for you. The slope of this line has a dimension of length, and it is about 11.32 centimeters. Is it a coincidence that this is nearly the length of my fingers? Let me know what you think about this in the comments down below. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. If this video gets a lot of likes, I'll teach you a simple way to make your card launch in a much more repeatable way. Thanks for watching and see you next time.